Well, Tom Brokaw called them the greatest generation, the men and women who served our nation during World War II. They grew up on farms or they worked in factories. Some of them left high school early to support their families during the Great Depression when suddenly they were called to defend their nation on the battlefield and in other places. Those who are still living are in their late 80s and 90s and some are over 100 years old and still alive. They are our parents, our grandparents, and even our great-parents, great-grandparents. Most of us, most of us here today grew up as citizens of the United States when it was known as a superpower, not just a powerful nation, but more powerful than any of the others. No one in their right mind would mess with us. But in the 1930s and in the 1940s, it wasn't so. The United States was a strong nation, but so was Germany and England and France and Japan and the Soviet Union. The eventual outcome of World War II was not nearly as predictable as it may have appeared many years later as we reflect. Nazi Germany conquered Austria and Hungary and Poland and Italy and France, and they were about to conquer Great Britain, at least that was part of its plan. My mother lived in England at that time. She was born there, grew up there, and she remembered being in London watching oil bombs fall from the sky as Germany firebombed London. The attacks came night after night after night. And if you were alive then, no one knew for certain what their future would be. Years later, 10, 15, 20 years later, we learned how closely, how close Germany was to creating an atomic bomb, which could have changed everything. We heard stories of kidnapped scientists and physicists, of research facilities that were secretly destroyed, of a potential outcome of a war that was, that was strategically avoided. What if those key moments hadn't happened? My generation, we joked that we'd all be speaking German. But for the greatest generation, that was not a joke. The only certainty they knew during World War II was the uncertainty of their future. And then, and then it was over. VE Day had arrived, victory in Europe. The newspaper headline said, peace or victory or surrender. Men and women flooded the streets of the cities and the towns and scenes like this one became commonplace. And suddenly we weren't thinking of the what ifs anymore. Our well, friends, today is Easter. We have gathered to celebrate the anniversary of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a great day. It was a great event. The women headed to the tomb to anoint the lifeless body of Jesus. And when they got there, he wasn't. Frantic and distraught, they confused Jesus for the caretaker of the cemetery. And Jesus called Mary by name, and suddenly she gets it. He, Jesus, is alive. He is risen. But what if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead? What if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead? Well, we'd be home right now. We would not be wearing these new clothes. We would not be having ham later today, at least not all of us. We would not have Starburst jelly beans. We would not have Cadbury mini chocolate eggs two of my favorite Easter snacks. <laughs> we would not have peeps. Marshmallow peeps. Does anybody eat these? I don't, I don't know that anybody eats these, but let me tell you something. Last night I went to Target at 7.30 to buy these things for today, and I went to the rack where they have the peeps, and guess what? Gone. Gone. So I thought, oh my gosh, there are people in this world who like these things. <laughs> this is like my least favorite thing in the world. 
but they were gone. And then I realized what it was. They just look good in the Easter basket. This time tomorrow, this time next week, this time two weeks from now, they will be hard as rocks. And no one will eat these. You could have these. <laughs> what if it hadn't happened? What if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead? I've been thinking about that for a few weeks now, and my short answer is, my short answer is, it would be Good Friday forever. And that would not be good. Let's review. God created the universe and everything in it to live in harmony with God, but humanity rebelled against God and sin entered the world. Remember Adam and Eve. God had created a nation, a chosen group of people he called his own. His desire was to bless them so that they could be a blessing to the entire world. Remember Abraham. God gave them rules to live by, guidelines for them to follow so they could experience, listen carefully, the best God has to offer. But they disobeyed and they sinned against God. Remember Moses. All along, God wanted to live in peace and harmony with the children of his creation those he loved with a love beyond compare. Now, friends, I have just compressed several thousand years into two short paragraphs. God loves creation deeply, but people do not understand. They are unable to embrace God's love for them. Their sin and their self-centeredness and their stubbornness keeps them from God. And so God sends his son who will live a sinless life who will suffer and die for all of the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, so that they, so that we, will have life in all of its fullness the way God created life to be. God took on human form, an immaculate conception, not reception, conception, a virgin birth, a perfect, sinless life on earth, a life of teaching and preaching, a life of loving and serving, a life of hope and vision. And then, and then there was a betrayal and an arrest and a trial and a humiliation and a cross. So imagine the followers of Jesus during that last week of his life. They did not know what we now know on Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, the holy city of David, and the capital of Judaism, and that's important to know, they thought, they thought he would ease onto the throne of Messiah and King. And as they celebrated, the opponents of Jesus schemed. And during that dreadful week, the followers of Jesus went from, oh yeah, we're with Jesus, he's the man, to we have no idea who you are talking about. We've never even seen the guy. And as the events deteriorated, so did their hopes and dreams, betrayed. But I thought all of us loved him and pledged our allegiance to him. Arrested. But he really hasn't done anything wrong. He has only done good things. Denied. Not you too, Peter. You were so close to him crucified. How could you let something like this happen, God? He loved you so much. Dead. I guess he really wasn't who he said he was, God's son, king of Israel, savior of the world. We were wrong. We were fools to believe. They believed. They linked their lives and their destinies to Jesus because they trusted that what he said was true. They followed him because they wanted to go where he was going to share the message of hope and redemption and to see the kingdom of God come on earth. Hear these words. If there is no resurrection, friends, then it's Good Friday forever. And all the hopes and dreams of the disciples are dashed upon the rocks. Their involvement, enthusiasm, their efforts are wasted. The movement is defeated, and those who once believed in Jesus will quietly fade away. 
If it hadn't happened, we wouldn't have this church. We wouldn't have any church, as a matter of fact. I wouldn't have a job. I can see you're upset about that. <laughs> I'm just saying. If it hadn't happened, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, we would not have eternal life after death. We would not have a better place to go when we die. We would not have this chance to live with Jesus when life on earth comes to an end. And we would not have this opportunity to usher our loved ones into the kingdom when they die. We would not have forgiveness for our sins. It's through his death and resurrection that Jesus was able to pay the penalty for our sins, yours and mine. Second chances, we would have no second chances with God. Forgiveness provides a fresh start and a clean slate, a chance to try again. We would not have second chances. But on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, who never stopped loving Jesus, went to the tomb to care for his lifeless body. And when she got there, she found a pile of burial cloths in an empty tomb. Crushed and confused at first when she encountered Jesus walking in the graveyard, and when he spoke her name, her tears turned into rejoicing. And she ran, and she told everyone that she had seen the Lord and that he is alive. And they jumped up and down in celebration because all that stuff that they thought about Jesus and hoped was true about Jesus until they saw that he was crucified and dead and buried. But now it was, and it is true. Son of God, Savior of the world, the one who died that we may have life, the one who makes forgiveness possible, the one who provides second chances, the one who offers new beginnings for everyone, the one who walks with us in life, the one who comforts us, true, 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 and true. No, 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 not yet. Not yet. The things Jesus did are sufficient for our salvation. It's enough. It's enough to save us. He did all of that. Everything that was necessary, Jesus did it all. We don't have to do anything else. Nothing else. He did it all for us. Well, actually, there is one thing. We have to accept it. That's it. We have to receive it. We have to embrace it. We have to close our hand around it. Some of us have a hard time believing that it's that simple, but it is that simple. Some of us resist accepting what God wants to give us. We shouldn't. And so let me try it a different way. Suppose I come to you and I say that I want to give you this gold coin. It is a genuine $10 gold piece from 1859. It was worth $10 then, but it's worth way more than that now because it's gold. And you can have it for free. And you might wonder if I'm serious. And you may question whether it's really mine to give or whether it's really gold or if there is a catch. But once you have worked through all of that and you realize that it is something of worth, something that you'd like to have, and only one thing remains to complete the transaction. You have to accept it. And you have to close your hand around it. Having Jesus in your life, having Jesus as your Savior and friend is of great worth. It's the best thing that can happen to you. It's something you would like to have. You just may not know that yet. And you don't have to earn it. You don't have to jump through any hoops to deserve it or to get it. It's already paid for. You just simply have to accept it and close your hand around it. And you know, if you've never done that before, if you have never really embraced Jesus and invited him into your life, then you could do that today. And then if someone asked you, you could say, well, yeah, I accepted Jesus on Easter 2012. And that would mean today, 
would be your spiritual birthday. And so I will pray a prayer out loud. And if if you pray it silently with me, then that's all it takes. So let me lead you in this prayer. God, thank you for your son who died for my sins so that I could be forgiven and have a second chance. Thank you that salvation is not about what I must do. It is about what you have already done. I accept your gift of love and your sacrifice for me. I open up myself to you. Come into my life. Let's walk together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now if you prayed that prayer, then please tell somebody. Somebody that you can trust, somebody that you want to know. You could tell me, you could tell Tracy, um, you could tell a good friend. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, then today is your spiritual birthday. So happy birthday. Jesus says there is rejoicing in heaven when someone recognizes their need for Jesus and they, and they invite him into their life. In a few moments, we're going to sing the Alleluia Chorus. And we are singing it because we are celebrating Jesus' resurrection once again. But if you accepted Jesus today, we are also singing it in celebration of you.